Hello, my name is Renato Ambrosio Jr. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm very happy and honored to be here. And I thank Drs. Hafezi, uh, Farhad Hafezi, Nikki Hafezi for the invitation to participate in this great meeting. Um, my topic is cross-linking effects on corneal topography and tomography, and I may expand this to corneal imaging. It's very important that we disclosure our financial relationships with companies like Oculus and my master class course with over 20 hours of, of, of classes in this topic. I also would like to acknowledge my supporters, uh, many companies that help us in the Valley Tune awareness campaign. It's a global awareness campaign on keratoconus and I invite all of you to participate. When you think about advanced diagnosis for corneal ectasia, we have to think about the what's, the why's and how's. It's different to screen a patient that is a candidate for laser vision correction, for refractive surgery, than when we think about going beyond but not over detecting keratoconus with corneal topography for detecting the mild cases to enhance the idea to characterize ectasia susceptibility. When we manage patients with keratoconus or corneal ectasia prior to keratoplasty, considering the paradigm shift that we have and the paradoxes that we created when to do surgery, we have to think about individualized treatments. We have to think about how to apply what we are trying to, to learn from the patient with the diagnosis. And this algorithm, which is the ancient philosophy and artificial intelligence combined, should be considered by us. Characterizing ectasia susceptibility, screening, diagnosing, staging, classifying the ectasia, prognosing, Clinical follow-up, all of these are important for us. So we do that with multimodal corneal imaging. Not only cornea, refractive surgery imaging involves cornea, optics, and eventually goes beyond the understanding of the eye uh, to genetics and considering imaging going from data that we have to analyze shape, geometry, cells, biomechanical properties to the understanding of molecular biology. Evolution in corneal imaging uh, has been really uh, acknowledged and accepted by uh, the community when we have topography and tomography. Tomography gives you a three-dimensional reconstruction of the cornea. And we started doing that in the OBSCAN when I was a resident with Dr. Tadeu Cidental in Sao Paulo. And the OBSCAN gives you a horizontal translation of the shine plug images. We, at that time, started a project called Orbicon, and this image that was a cartoon from of the slides that we have for educating us to understand elevation and thickness maps. We have this as a very inciting for the understanding of the thickness in the center and in the periphery so that we got the thickness profile concept. At that time we were talking about enhancing diagnosis and cases like this one would intrigue us because of the very asymmetric. We, that time we were talking about unilateral disease Today, we have a more evolving concept of bilateral keratoconus and very asymmetric keratoconus and eventually unilateral ectasia due to mechanical forces. So it's important to understand that we are evolving. And when we saw the shine flug images themselves at the display in the pentacam and also with the rotating fashion, we started connecting this as a future of the corneal imaging technologies. So. Tomography comes from Greek and means to have a cut section of the cornea and we have a three-dimensional reconstruction from those images that are connected uh, by the software. So we have different machines, instruments by different companies uh, that do rotation, shine flug imaging, and also the orb scan, the classic orb scan that have the horizontal and the VX130 gives you superior and inferior scanning. We, we need to study those possibilities and eventually look at the benefits, but today rotation fashion is probably the most common and the most advantageous approach. When you think about concepts for diagnosis, it's very important that we have data, parameters. These parameters have to be considered in terms of their accuracy because we need a reference value for calculating accuracy and also on precision, which is the repeatability of the measurements uh, 
uh, within the same subject. If you do five consecutive measurements or three, you can calculate the precision, the repeatability. It's important that we organize those parameters in display so that we can make clinical decisions and eventually artificial intelligence can help us very much if you know how to program, if you know what to ask for the, for the data and how to develop a study so that you get artificial intelligence to look with a multi-dimension approach considering many parameters that go beyond, uh, that this idea would go beyond our uh, capability as humans to analyze the data. The Pentacam, for example, is a multimodal imaging approach, not only because of the cornea and anterior segment data that is classically provided by the Scheinflug imaging, but also because we have now axial length and ocular wavefront. And I can tell you this, will, this list will continue. We have data from many parts uh, of, of the diagnostic approach, for example, angle closure glaucoma, and you see the histograms. Now these histograms is from a population of disease and known disease, and you can see each of the parameters, and it's very intuitive to make uh, a judgment and eventually use this data for clinical decision. It's been over 10 years now that we started working and collaborating with Michael Belling for the enhanced approach, which we have front and back elevation and thickness profile. And Michael has done a very nice contribution recently that we'll discuss on the progression display. The ABCD progression display is an enhanced detection for pr progression. And despite of sometimes a stable interior surface because it considers front and back curvature and also thickness. The very nice contribution as well is related to the interpretation because we have the 80 95% confidence intervals of the, of the measurement so that we can rely on the scientific data if this change is significant. And we have different gates for normal, which is the ones I use and recommend for mild cases of keratoconus, for advanced moderate keratoconus, which are the ones that we should see if the change is related to, to, to a noise from the instrument or if this is significant. And more recently, this has been introduced at this meeting the post-cross-linking uh, repeatability studies done by uh, Michael, along with Professor Seitz from Hamburg and, and, and Hafezi from, from Zurich. This is going to be released uh, very soon. So we have this very nice gates. You see the front surface is stable in this example, but considering uh, cross-linking was done, for this, for this patient, you see, you see some progression on the thickness and on loss of this correct vision. cross linking was done. And you see that after one year, the gates appear so that you can rely on the data for analyzing the progression after cross-linking. Segmental tomography can be done with OCT and with very high frequency ultrasound. And segmental microlayer layer tomography was introduced many years ago by Dan Weinstein work with the high frequency ultrasound. We are all um, far familiar with this very nice approaches for individualized segmental layer for the flap, for the epithelium. This has been more popularized with the OCT, with the great work done by uh, David Huang and Yang Li. This is not only going to be important for the diagnosis, but also for following patients that had keratoconus surgery like corneal ring segments. This is the epithelial hyperplasia and thinning. This is a modulation of the epithelium that occurred about one week to a month after surgery. And also for looking at the post cross linking uh, um, detection of the, of the demarcation line so that we can see different approaches for cross linking like in this great work by Professor Francois Malaké is published in the Journal of Refractive Surgery, in which you can see the demarcation line very well so that you can compare different approaches. Uh, it's interesting that shape of the corn evolved to corneal biomechanical properties, and today we do that with the Scheinflug imaging. The Corvus takes in uh, 31 milliseconds, 140 frames, and we characterize the deformation of the cornea, and we have different data uh, starting from the work, great work by Ricardo and Paolo Vinciguera that we have collaborated for the CBI, in which we have the ability to characterize a software and a for cornea. The idea we have to combine tomography and biomechanical approach 
using artificial intelligence lead us to the tomography and biomechanical index. This is the first publication in 2017, and we, we have a second version and with much higher accuracy. This is by itself today still the best parameter, but even though we can do much better with more training, considering artificial intelligence with more parameters and better uh, design populations, larger populations. I'll give you a clinical example. This young male came with asymmetric erotoconus. You see the right eye is very normal. This is the Ambrosio 2 scale. This is the classic atlas scale. And how the imaging can help me here. First, to confirm the patient does not have unilateral disease. He has mild form through erotoconus. And the nomenclature here can be considered a topic for discussion, but he has mild disease considered the TBI, even though the, the bad D is 1.38. But the fellow eye, not only we can detect keratoconus and considering age, see, you, you need to do surgery now, you lost vision, you have high chances for progression, considering stiffness parameter, nicely described by Cynthia Roberts, you have this patient uh, decided not to do surgery. And this patient, if you see K-max, would have a decrease in K-max. But if you change, if you from, from the K-max evaluation to the map subtraction, this is the B, the more recent map, minus the D, which is the first evaluation, you see clearly there is a stiffening, and you can see more red here, which is more obvious on the gates in the front and back surface, and also almost in the thickness here, if you, if you consider the uh, this is an unquestionable uh, documentation of progression. So it's important that we try to avoid problems. In this case, another situation, this patient came as a candidate for refractive surgery a few years ago, and we did SMILE. The SMILE was very nicely done. The tomography would give us not a red flag, but maybe a yellow flag on the bed D and on the Artmax, but we decided to do SMILE. The patient did very well. This is one year. This is two years, and this is four years when we have unquestionable ectasia. The fellow eye, everything looks normal. What I would call the attention is that with the Ambrosio 2 scale, you have a little bit of something here, but is this clear when you look at elevation? The back elevation, using the same reference for the, for the first examination, the right eye and left eye, you see there's an a, a elevation enhanced here that this should be detected, and eventually it could be more aggressive with telling the patient not to rub the eye and eventually considering cross-linking. But she came back two years later with more advanced keratoconus. We did surgery in her. Uh, first, uh, not to have ectasia in the left eye was very important and epithelial thickness hyperplasia, different than the thinning, was a very important tool along with biomechanical markers that I'll show you. But the patient was advised not to rub the eye and do cross-linking in the right eye with a corneal ring implantation. The patient did very well, and this patient, you see the, the change here with, uh, with, uh, with tomography from looking at the front surface, this is segmental tomography, the epithelial change, and also you can see some changes on biomechanics. Interestingly, the whole CT also can give you some evidence of cross-linking in the center of the cornea, even though I inject the riboflavin only in the tunnel of the corneal ring segment implantation with no epithelium removal. The fellow eye has a stable CBI, both LVCs, a nice work by Hikaru Vinciguera for enhancing the detection of ectasia after laser vision correction. You have both LASIK, DRK, and, and SMILE. And this is a patient that came from Brown to SMILE again. And what did I learn? I did learn that I could have prevented that if I had, at that time, the TBI the TBI was not uh, available at that time, but the data was available so we can get back calculation and you see ectasia susceptibility in the right eye. So this patient would be probably a better candidate for a fake IOL. The last uh, consideration is the Humboldt staging, biomechanical staging of keratoconus is a very nice display that we can see a very nice correlation, some of the parameters from Corvus and Pentacam for the sake of the understanding of progression. And this is a very interesting approach to combine. So we have to combine what we are trying to achieve, understand what we have, 
and stand the planning, customized evaluation of results for ectasia, characterizing susceptibilities different than diagnosing disease, staging, prognosing, classifying, follow-up. This is a true revolution in evolution that we have the ability to help our patients with unprecedented ways. So thank you very much for the kind attention and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this great meeting. Thank you.